All right. Well, thanks for joining us again. Hope you're having a great day. I'm going to conclude my little mini series on handling objections to the Christian faith. And the last one is perhaps the biggest and the most difficult one. And that is, why is there so much evil in the world? And we can hardly deny that there is a lot of evil in the world. And when it strikes each of us personally, that's when it's especially difficult. Philosophers and theologians have been debating this moral dilemma for centuries, so I know I'm certainly not going to solve it. I will share my personal thoughts on it, which I feel like have satisfied me. The classic statement comes from the 5th century BC, Greece. Either God is all powerful, but not all good, and therefore won't stop evil, or God is all good, but not all powerful, and therefore can't stop evil. But the Bible says clearly that God is both. He's both all powerful and all good. So what can we do? How can we handle this dilemma? Let me give you four possible answers that I hope will help you and enable you in, in sharing this objection if it comes your way. The first is Satan brings much evil on the world. The Bible says that God has an arch enemy who seeks to destroy all that's good. Now, in the ancient Persian religion, Zoroastrianism, it had two equal gods, equal in power and ability. So one would prevail, the good God would prevail sometimes, and the evil God would prevail sometimes. And you know, in a way, that kind of makes sense, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Satan is not God. He's not equal with God. He is a created being, a very high ranking, perhaps the highest ranking spiritual being that God made, who fell because of pride and rebelled. He, he wanted the worship do God alone. And so he was cast out of heaven. The Bible says that he tempts human beings. Adam and Eve were the first to be led astray and into sin. And as a result, sin came upon the world and is in all people. But the Bible says that Christ defeated him on the cross. And so the punishment of sin, his ability to hold souls in hell forever, has been defeated, as well as the power of sin has been defeated by the cross. That, that means that we can overcome sin. We can say no to sin because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. I believe that if everyone was saved, that would reduce so much evil in the world. The Bible says that Satan's fate is sealed. He will be cast into hell forever. A second solution is that humans are responsible for most of the evil in the world. Paul doesn't speak about Satan all that much. You've heard the phrase, the devil made me do it. And, and that's the excuse. But Paul doesn't really blame Satan for all the evil in the world. He blames sin. We human beings agree with Satan to sin and break God's laws. In the 1960s, Stanley Milgram did a very interesting experiment to, the, to me shows human depravity. He, he strapped actors to an electric chair. It looked like an electric chair. It wasn't actually one. And then he brought people in off the street to see if they would shock someone. So those people brought in for the experiment could see the person behind glass, that they were strapped to an electric chair, that they could hear them, their, their moans and groans. They were asked if they would shock someone before the experiment started. 90% said they would not shock anyone. 100% of the participants did. Again, they weren't really being shocked. They were faking, acting like they were being shocked. 80% of the respondents shocked that person to intense levels and 65% to dangerous levels of 450 volts, which would cause death. And they did it because an authority figure in a lab coat told them to. So the question is, why didn't God just make a world where sin was impossible? God wanted to create a world in which there was free will, where 
people he created would willingly worship him. That made evil a possibility. But it also made heroism and altruism and courage possible. A third explanation is suffering is somehow God's plan for man now. It seems like it's built into creation. It brings good out of bad, though. Jesus' disciples one time saw a man born blind, and they asked Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, Neither sinned. This has happened that the glory of God might be seen. God uses suffering to sanctify us. You have a heart attack and you survive it, which leads you to change your lifestyle to a more healthy one. It can lead an unbeliever to God. He suffers in some way and then cries out to God, repents of his sin and is saved. Suffering can unite us you go through something difficult and you see someone else going through something difficult and you can help them and minister to them because of your experience of going through it. And disasters seem to always bring out the best in people, that they help their community. Communities come together in those times. And God suffers with us. Christianity is the only religion where God dies to save sinners. The cross was undoubtedly unfair and cruel. It was the ultimate evil against purity and against God himself, but it also was the greatest act of love. And so we see salvation comes through suffering. And finally, natural evil is a mystery. Why does the tornado roar through a town and destroy homes on one side of the street and not the other? I guess the classic example of the mystery of suffering is Job in the Old Testament. He lost everything. He lost all 10 of his children in one day. He lost all his wealth and he lost his health. So the question is, could he still love and trust God even though he did not understand why he suffered so much? And the book of Job shows us that he could, it's possible for a human being to not understand why there's so much evil in the world and still love God. And so I think that's the challenge for us, to trust God and love him even when we don't understand. I'm gonna pass it over to Kathy now. I don't know if this is re relates, but last night I had a thought that I think kind of relates to this, that you had, you know, the pure one, pure God, holy, good, who entered our world system and ended up getting killed like the electric chair as a criminal. And so he wasn't absent from this whole process of the world and its suffering. He he came as totally pure and then he was, he was crucified as a criminal and being absolutely pure. Um, I, there is so much to, I think, embrace in what Ed has shared just for what we're living in right now. Um, I, I think that one can say, you know, what are the things that are really unchangeable right now? And they certainly have to do with God and what he loves, what he desires, what he's attracted to. Um, I... I know that I'm finding stability right now and just where Jesus said, I speak what I see and hear. So if I could just be in Christ and know he is seeing and hearing what's hap happening in heaven and what's going to play out in our world in the months, years to come, I have a peace because it's, it's in, it's being spoken in heaven. Um, God, as far as humans are concerned, is attracted to humility, and he seems to delight in causing oppressed people to stand. I just have a couple verses, or several verses. Second Chronicles 12, 7. When the Lord saw they humbled themselves, the Lord's message came. 
They have humbled themselves, so I will not destroy them. I will deliver them soon. He had a, a change. Proverbs 16, verse 19, better to be lowly in spirit with the afflicted than to share the spoils with the proud. That's kind of timely, isn't it? I think we want to be on a victory side here. Maybe it would be better to be um, lowly in spirit with the afflicted. Um, Psalm 76, 9, God arose to exe execute judgment and to deliver the oppressed of the earth. He rose to do that for the oppressed. The tax collector who could not even lift his head to look at God went home justified. And if we think about it, isn't that how we want to go home? That we're, we go home forgiven. So when we go back to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it begins with humble yourselves. I thought there is so many things we cannot do for ourselves. We can't add an inch to our stature. We can't forgive ourselves in the sense of getting rid of the blood, getting rid of our sin. But this is something that God has told us that we can do for ourselves. We can humble ourselves. And both Old and New Testament, it means a bowing. It means becoming low, low caste, low estate, even can mean depressed. So we, you know, Peter was so amazing because he walked with Jesus physically, and then he walked in the spirit with Jesus. So I think he really understood something about what Jesus wanted as far as humility and and how we would go about that. He says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time if you humble yourself under his mighty hand by casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. I just want to draw attention to the word casting. I mean, people would know it as a participle, I-N-G in the continuum. The footnote here has like some of the version, versions actually treat this as an independent command, like humble yourself, cast your cares. But the truth is it's a participle, casting, and it's connected with the verb humble yourself. As such, it is not giving a new command, but it's defining how believers humble themselves. Taking the participle as it means enriches the understanding of both verbs. Humbling oneself is not a negative act of self-denial per se, but a positive one of active dependence on God for help. So if you think of becoming of low estate, you could think of even a low posture, like being at his feet and being at the feet of one who cares and, and coming to the point that I trust the one whose feet I am at. And it, it's interesting to play on cares, cast your cares upon you because he cares for you. So if you let some of your cares stand outside of his care for you, I think there's some pride in that actually. You are not humbling into the fact, or I'm not humbling into the fact that God cares so much I can give my cares. We just um, last week um, watched a documentary I would so highly recommend called In His Image. And I mean, those of us that are parents, I mean, sometimes my children are so ingrained in my heart. I have a hard time casting them at the feet of Jesus. But it was so interesting as this one girl that had definitely been a prodigal was coming back and her godly mother heard the Lord say at something she had waited years as she prayed. He said, only one of us is going to deal with her. As if to say, who is it going to be? Is it going to be you or is it going to be me? And I think we could look at a lot of our cares that way. That God's saying, 
only one of us is going to handle this. So who is it going to be? Um, you know, and James, he also seems to parallel what Peter is saying, realizing and this could be something about evil in the world. The spirit that God caused to live within us has an envious yearning. So we are kind of set in place with something that's going to be have a tendency to, to lust or yearn for things it shouldn't. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So submit to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. And if you know, I know this is going to be longer and Ed has shared so completely. And I and I just love that. So I will try not to draw out a few points I want to. But it almost as if God gave us a spirit that was going to require him to give greater grace. So if we're not humble, we're not going to be as on the side of getting grace. We're going to be stuck with this envious spirit and, and actually opposed. And you know, this song over this whole season by John Michael Talbot, cast your cares upon him, lay your life upon him, for only he is worthy to stand. I'm at his feet, he's standing. In tribulation, trial, and sorrow, when you can't see through tomorrow, he'll reveal to you the frailty of a man. I think we spent our whole lives never wanting that encounter with our own frailty. But that is where grace is found at the feet of Jesus. And, you know, I just kind of realized we cannot lose if we are humble because we're on the side of God's grace. God will make you stand in due time and it will be his pleasure to. And then kind of the offshoot of that, we cannot win, and this could be in our present times, if we are proud. We are not a true winner if we're proud. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Father, you are good. I am so glad that you care for us. You care for us individually and corporately, the church. You care for this country. You care for the world. And you have a plan. So, Lord, deepen our trust to see you move, that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.